Welcome to the Dialogue by Wirepoints, connecting the dots between our economy, government, and people. And now your hosts, Ted Dabrowski and Mark Glennon. Welcome to the Dialogue. This is Ted Dabrowski from Wirepoints, and I'm with my partner, Mark Glennon. And uh, thanks for joining us. And today we have a special guest, Frank McCormick. Um, Frank is a, uh, a teacher at the Waukegan High School. And for those of you who don't know where Waukegan is, it's probably some 30 miles plus north of Chicago, right on the right on Lake Michigan. And um, you know, Frank is a teacher there, and he's gained a little bit of nor- notoriety because he's been speaking out against the ideological infiltration of critical race theory, critical social justice that's been um, you know, hitting all of our schools across the country. And he's, he's doing it under the moniker Chalkboard Heresy. And uh, he's gotten a lot of attention. He's been in the Chicago Tribune recently in the Chalkboard Review. And he's, he's been talking about education on, I saw him on Fox News recently. So he's out there. Uh, Frank has his uh, ed- education degree in history from Lake Forest College. And uh, I've had been in a couple of meetings with him. So I've gotten to, to know him and, and why he's saying what he's saying. But uh, why don't we start off right off the bat, Frank? What, what is wrong What's going on in our schools and why are you suddenly speaking up? And then we can go backwards and get your, your background a little bit and, and tell us about Waukegan. But why are you speaking up suddenly and, and why? What is concerning you? What should what should normal parents be worried about? Sure. Well, thank you for having me. Um, what is going on? I, I think that what we have seen is an acceleration of ideological instruction in public education um, I think that a lot of parents will know that there's kind of been a, a left wing or a liberal kind of slant education and um, people have put up with it for a while and, you know, just kind of accepted that, you know, well, this is, you know, teachers tend to be more liberal. So there's going to be some of that. I think what we've seen is the acceleration of it. I noticed in 2016, um, many teachers with the election of Donald Trump became in, increasingly political in their classrooms. I think uh, Donald Trump's election served as a call to action. I thought it was obnoxious, but generally just focused on what I could control, which was uh, in my classroom. Uh, for me, things began to change in 2020 with George Floyd. That's where I saw many teachers commit to this idea of, of racial justice, which the idea itself, you know, it's it, sounds like a good idea. Um, but racial justice, as they call it, became kind of a component of their classroom. And what kind of struck me was I was watching as most Americans were as kind of, you know, violence was hitting our streets. And this this wasn't just the protest. This was, you know, the violence where you saw calls to revolution and you saw acts of destruction and blood red paint splattered across, you know, uh, statues of Abraham Lincoln or Thomas Jefferson or George Washington and young people calling for revolution. And I started to think about where this goes if an increasing number of young people are kind of inculcated into these ideologies that call specifically for such or that create enough anger and resentment and hostility where they see um, that as a, a... as an alternative to, you know, the American Republic, um, some type of new regime, some type of revolution. And it started to concern me. It's, it seemed kind of at first, I said, maybe this is crazy, but the more I thought about it and the more I kind of drew on my history background and, and saw how, uh, regime changes occur and how revolutions occur, um, I started to become concerned and I started to talk to other people, educators, um, academics and bouncing this idea off them. I said, do you think this is crazy to think that this is where we go um, with it now becoming with this ideology kind of dominating K to 12 education, where in the past it had been primarily relegated to a university level. And um, they, you know, told me, you know, yeah, that I, I see what you're saying and uh, I can see where this heads and uh, I'm concerned too. And so then it was just a matter of speaking out about it. And um, I I kind of played with the idea for a while. And I, you know, initially came out kind of under an anonymous moniker. I think that lasted about a few weeks before I said, you know what, I have to put my name behind this because otherwise I'm just another person behind a screen that can say whatever they want. So I did. I put my name behind it. And uh, 
it was kind of history from there, as they say. Yeah, your uh, editorial in the Chicago Tribune was really superb, which summarized your views on this. But tell me, uh, did you take any heat from this? Did uh, any problems from the school or from other teachers that you heard from on this or parents? Thank you. Um, I started taking heat initially with uh, the Chicago Tribune article was probably the least controversial thing. What what started the heat was just me publishing this blog. Um, I think it was some of the language I used. It was very metaphorical in nature. Uh, and I, I think a lot of people didn't understand the metaphorical language I was using. They, they didn't understand. They just thought, Hey, this guy's crazy. He's writing about, he's saying he's a priest and that there's religion in school. Uh, they totally, you know, it flew over a lot of people's heads, which was fine. Um, as I started speaking out more specifically about my school and started saying, Hey, look, here's what's happening in my school and doing so unapologetically, I think that was what really uh, irked some people is that I wasn't apologizing. I wasn't um, backing down or withdrawing what I said. I was actually very intent on speaking unfiltered and sometimes saying provocative, controversial things and, and just saying, yeah, I'm, I'm sticking by this and um, I'm not apologizing and uh, defending my right to freedom of speech uh, that exists for left-leaning teachers did it did it go to the extent of jeopardizing your job position or did you fear for that at all it's funny uh it, it has and it hasn't so there's there's definitely been moves on their part to kind of uh what i've what i've called lining up their shot um which is what i think they've been doing but they've been also cautious at the same time and i believe that was because of how i did things i made a calculated decision early on to come at this very loud, very fast and very hard. And I, I call it kind of the, you know, for those that remember, you know, Donald Rumsfeld back in 2003 in the Iraq war, a shock and awe, which was kind of a take on, you know, blitzkrieg, which is where you go, you know, lightning war, you just overwhelm them with more than they can kind of take and leave them kind of um, a little bit stunned. And I think that's what I did as I, I very quickly focused on building up an audience. I, I focused on kind of creating a brand for this. Uh, I think people didn't understand at first, why is there this kind of brand to it? Well, I wanted it to kind of, I wanted to get publicity because I felt that was the only way that was, uh, or the only way to protect myself was that if I had some uh, following on social media, if I, if I made it into, you know, at the time I didn't know, I think I started off in the first week, I had a hundred people following me. I was like, okay, well, it's a start. And, uh, you know, but I said, gosh, if I can get this up to a few thousand and if I can get on some, uh, nationally syndicated radio shows and stuff, so that I might kind of insulate myself from what they would like to do, which is to make this disappear quietly. And once that wasn't an option for them, I think they kind of had to reckon with me and so um yeah there's there's been some blowback but it's been done in a way that uh that shows they're a little bit concerned and afraid i mean they pulled me into the administrative office but they were very intent on saying this is non-disciplinary and they had their attorney do all the speaking so um you can read that for how you want i mean the, the way i see it is they love to ask me they just can't and so that's the reason they did things the way they did so i've been thinking about how do you what are the implications of this for other teachers and you know the optimist in me wants to see it kind of as, as a model like if you're going to do this if you're going to blow the whistle know how to do it the days of doing it quietly and subtly and with a nice letter to hr and your department chair expressing your concerns are over they're going to get rid of you you got to go big and you got to go hard because that's the only thing they seem to respond to. Well, Frank, let's, let's back up a step because, you know, sure. it's uh, obviously anytime we speak up on these issues, it becomes contentious and uh, a lot of battles. Mm -hmm. And what I want people to understand, and you know, I, I keep arguing that there's so many people who don't understand what CRT is. And every time we talk about it, you know, half the people try to say that, it, well, it doesn't exist, right? It's not being taught in schools or, or there's people who just don't see, one side of the media, they only see the, it's called the mainstream mainstream media, and they don't see all the CRT stuff. So what is it that you've seen in your school? And, you know, let, let's, let's try to keep it like in, in general understanding for, for people who 
mm-hmm. who don't buy into this. What is it that that you're seeing is being taught, or how is it being taught? What what is what is so bad about it? And what are the examples that that I think if if a mom or dad understood what's going on in their classroom, it would really tick them off. They just don't really know it. So what is this thing about? Okay, so to put it in simple terms, um, first I'll say that. I understand people's skepticism when they hear CRT. It's become a buzzword. I, I used to be someone who myself, especially as a young teacher, was was on the left who would describe myself as a liberal. So I understand, you know, people hear, uh, you know, Fox News and, you know, this teacher, They it's easy to write someone off as, you know, being on the right. And yes, I'm a conservative now, but I wasn't always. So I get that. Uh, CRT in education, it's not going to be explicitly taught as critical race theory. They're absolutely right when they say critical race theory is not taught. It exists um, as in in the application, um, what we, we call praxis. And the best uh, example I can give to, you know, parents and, and kind of lay people is think of the scientific method. Uh, your doctor was taught the scientific method, but that doesn't mean that he talks about it when, you know, he has an appointment. He uses it as a tool. And it's the same thing in education. And a lot of uh, educators use it without realizing that that's what they're using. Um, so sometimes educators, are they're not being dishonest when they say, I don't teach CRT. They, they don't realize the level it's influenced them. But it's really a, a way of understanding the world. And it's a, it's a tool to, to kind of uh, interrogate and parse out racial issues in our society. So what it may look like is when you have lessons or activities that are kind of filtered through a very specific lens, uh, that lens being that racism is normative, that American society and institutions are inherently racist. When you have uh, lessons that have students kind of parse out racial issues with those assumptions, it's not saying just talking about race. It's when you assume that racism is this normative part of our everyday society and that we are an inherently racist nation. Um, As a teacher, the first thing I'll say is that those, those things are, they're assumptions and they, they deserve to be challenged and they need to be challenged. And so a lot of times with CRT and education, the starting point is that America is a racist society and systemic racism is everywhere. And the problem I see with this, uh, especially in education, is that when you're dealing with students, they already are prone to see the world in primary colors. And you're giving them a very productive worldview where everything can be kind of boiled down to, you know, it's racism. And it kind of fits with them because it explains a lot of things that require more complex, um, analyses. Uh, and in terms of the harm I see it causing, it's it's antagonistic. Um, critical race theory and the way it manifests in education is antagonistic in the sense that it kind of divides society into two classes, you know, oppressor and oppressed. When you get into it, white people are oppressors and non-white people are oppressed. Um, is that specifically mentioned, you know, it depends on, you know, which, which school you're talking about, which teacher you're talking about, how much they decide to go into this. But I've seen, for example, lessons in my own school district. The one that stood out to me the most was um, a lesson asking students to kind of do an analysis between uh, the police today and Confederate slave patrols. And that to me, you know, drawing that parallel for students without asking them, is there a parallel without, re- I mean, that's something that deserves a heavy conversation with a lot of questions. And it was just kind of built in as this assumption that, yeah, there's, there's a connection now, now prove to us what that connection is. And some people said, well, well, big deal. It's just one lesson. I'm like, you know what? It is a big deal because it may just be one lesson, but it's, it's one lesson that characteristic of, of what we're talking about. And that's a pretty powerful message to impart on, especially, you know, uh, black students, which were the uh, primary makeup of the class. You teach them that that the police are parallel to, you know, slave patrols from 175 years ago. Plus, 
I, I can't imagine what that does to their perception of the police and how that shapes their interaction, possibly for, for the worse, where they might, you know, might put them in a situation where they may be prone to to run or to want to defend themselves and and end up causing real real harm in such a such a circumstance and it also shapes their view in, in of the world of our country in such a terrible way based on something that i personally i don't think is true but if you were even going to have that conversation that deserves a lot of time and a lot of skepticism built into that lesson like that to even make it you know on the table in my classroom at least and you um, have a substantial number of black students at uh, Waukegan High School. Is it, it's that primarily, correct? yeah, it's primarily Hispanic, um, Hispanic and black. Um, in this class in particular, it was, it was majority black students. And yeah, I, I mean, I, we, we, we look at like, for example, when you look at, um, the statistics for being unarmed and being shot by police, um, if you're black, they're actually exceedingly rare, but in the cases where they do happen, one of the, uh, factors that increases the likelihood of being shot is running. And so that's something that gets left out of the conversation a lot is like, do not run, do not, you know, do things that increase that likelihood. And, and then I thought about a lesson like that. And I'm like, my gosh, like you're kind of, I mean, if I were a kid, especially a black and you're telling me that there's an equivalency between slave patrols and police, I'm running. And uh, we're talking, you know, there's a chance to do great harm. Um, just to students' lives through a lesson like that, which I'm sure the teacher never thought about, but to me it was kind of like glaringly obvious. And then the next part is, is that what does that kind of teach them about American society? If you have students that are being brought into this view that, you know, there's these terrible things going on like this, which I think, you know, it's just ridiculous, but you teach students that and they're not going to have a very positive view of our society and of our country. And history teaches us that, you know, when people have these kind of built in hostilities and resentments and, and these feelings of anger and something unleashes them like an economic crisis that it can play out in very tragic ways for the society as a whole. And so I kind of think about not just this lesson, but I think what's the cumulative effect. You have enough of these lessons over a period of time with enough students and you're kind of baking radicalism into our society. Uh, how about how about Hispanic students? Because you do have a lot of those at in uh, in Waukegan. Yes, it's, it's 80 um, percent. It's 80 percent marked in Waukegan. 80 percent are Hispanic and 13 percent are black. Do you have any sense for what they make of this? They, I would think they're kind of scratching their heads on it. And, uh, but w w what's the reaction you see there? It's funny. I, I think there's, um, there's a little bit of a cultural revolution going on within the Hispanic community because of uh, our school system. I think that you definitely have these kind of uh, forces that are working to radicalize them in some way. Um, the resistance is a little bit greater on their part because they do have a, a more traditional, uh, I would say conservative culture at home kind of working against that, but it's, it's wearing thin. I've, I've heard from a mix, a uh, mixture of students uh, for, I would say some are former students, some are students I didn't have, but they graduated who've reached out to me. Um, some have said, you know, well, I, I kind of support some of this. I believe some of this. And some have said, yeah, this this doesn't sit well with me. What, what really stood out to me were some students that, uh, these weren't my students, but they had graduated. And uh, they said, yeah, I'd heard about you. And I want to let you know, I went to Waukegan High School. And um, they said, yeah, I saw some of this political stuff. And I, I was too young to know what it was at the time, but it, it makes sense now. And uh, one girl, I'm actually going to be speaking to her next week. She's a former graduate, but she uh, told me that, you know, one of the things that she started to notice impact her life and it put her, she said, really in a bad place socially and, and I think psychologically was that her her peers started to, um, she she's Mexican and but lighter skinned and they started to make derogatory comments about her having lighter skin color and they start to say things to her like you know you're privileged you have white privilege and you won't understand racism or prejudice and at the time she's like what is going on and you know no one listened to her though they said there's no indoctrination there's no agenda there's none of this and she said when she saw me speaking about this she felt like well i'm not crazy and this this was the phenomenon you know that i was experiencing and um 
I think having that, you know, that former student voice telling us this is how it affected her and this is what's happening is really powerful. So that's uh, that's just an example. Frank, Frank I want to just delve in a little bit more into Waukegan and then I, I want to mm -hmm. pop back out and, and look at a, a new Trier example. New Trier, of course, being one of the wealthiest, you know, primarily white schools in, in, in Illinois. And, uh, but, you know, focusing on Waukegan, I, 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 as I mentioned uh, at the beginning, I I spent almost a year in Waukegan trying to promote school choice. We did something like knocked on 13,000 doors, mostly to, to the Hispanic homes, but a lot of the black homes and promoting what school choice was and that they should demand it in Waukegan. And, you know, the, the story is longer than that, but but it was a fascinating time. Uh, but I got to know the district really well. And I think it, it deserves, I'd like to understand what, what critical race theory means in a primar, primary primarily minority school and then I'd like to get your view on what it means in a place like Nutria, which is the opposite, because there's two different messages being sent. So, so for example, Waukegan, what I know is, as I just said, 80% Hispanic, 13% black. It's almost 70% low income. Uh, I was looking at some of the results um, of the educational results, and it makes me wonder why we're focused on, well, some will say we're focused on CRT because of these results. Others are saying you shouldn't focus on CRT because of these results. But I see that only you know 10% of... Um, of blacks, uh, third grade blacks can read at grade level, and just 16% mm -hmm. of Hispanics can read at grade level in the third grade. And everybody knows that if you can't read in the third grade, if you can't read at grade level and you get pushed through the system, you're going to be in deep, deep trouble. And the whole school, by the way, the whole school, including the whites there, um, overall, it's 16% can read at grade level in the third grade. And, you know, and that continues all the way through. I have the 11th grade numbers here, you know. Uh, on the SAT, 11th grade, you know, meet reading requirements, the whole school is like 12%. So, you know, how should we think about it? I mean, for me, it's crazy, right? Here you have a, a situation where people can't, kids can't perform. And yet, are we focused on the wrong things? Or, you know, they'll argue they're focused on the right things. So how do you, how do we, how do we take the CRT and try to match it up with these horrible results, sad, sad results? Well, I, I think what's, what's happening is that, um, and, and they're not using the word CRT there. You know, the district is using the word uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, um, regardless of what we call these different things. And there's there's nuance. I mean, these are very oftentimes nebulous terms. I, I use the word critical social justice, I think, more recently than just CRT because it's more an accurate descriptor. But for the district, from their standpoint, you look at those, um, those benchmarks and, and they're abysmal. I think this provides a very convenient excuse for them. And I called out the superintendent on this at the board speech. It's now she has a, a scapegoat and that scapegoat is systemic racism, white supremacy. Um, in the district emails, they refer to it as white dominant culture. It's all of a sudden not, you know, the bureaucratic and institutional failures. It's not a failure of, um, you know, the, the ideology that's been dominant in that school district for decades, which is probably more, you know, left-leaning critical social justice ideology. Well, it's it's white supremacy. It's systemic racism. And um, the great thing is they can say, well, it's always been there and we just now we're just identifying it. And what's really convenient about it is when these DEI measures fail, they can just point and say, well, that just means we need more of them because, you know, we just didn't realize how strong the hold of systemic racism was. I mean, it's the ultimate, you couldn't think of a better excuse. And bravo to the superintendent for, for seizing upon this. I mean, really, it, it's clever. And um, it's... I mean, it just makes you... It, it, it's it's so ingenious. It, it, it's, it makes you laugh because... It, but it works and it'll work for a lot of people too, because it'll, you know, it, it's so, it's so reductive and it's explanatory powers. It's just like. A scapegoat just, for failure. They, they right. seize, seize on that, but um, it, tell me to what extent it comes down from the top by state directive. And I'm thinking of two things here. First, you have a state law mandated training for teachers where I think every public school teacher has to go through racial training i mean again mm -hmm. it's crt by another name call it wokeism or whatever you want and secondly we have the new 
culturally responsive teaching and learning standards uh, that they claimed don't dictate content of of class classroom curricula, but we argue clearly do uh, influence it uh, heavily, although perhaps indirectly. Um, is there, in fact, encouragement for this CRT approach coming down from the state? I think there's definitely encouragement. Um, I don't know the degree. I mean, obviously, it being institutionalized through culturally relevant pedagogy um, is a clear sign it's becoming institutionalized. I'm not a big believer in, in conspiracy theories when people talk about some, you know, orchestrated plan. I, I don't necessarily see that. I have called it um, trickle down radicalism, where what's happening is, is these ideas are kind of overflowing from uh, higher education. Um, they started kind of in the, you know, sociology and philosophy departments It kind of trickled into the education schools and then they're trickling down into K to 12 and going into students. Um, culturally relevant pedagogy has really is starting to kind of take hold and that's influenced by culture, uh, by critical race theory. Um, the kind of, uh, author of culturally relevant pedagogy, Gloria Ladson Billings is also a critical race theorist and has helped bring it into education. Um, so the, the, the links are definitely there. Uh, I think the problem is, is whenever you engage with someone on this, they'll always say, yeah, well, but that's not the same. And you're like, you're right. It's not the same thing. Culturally relevant pedagogy is not critical race theory. I don't think that's what anyone's saying, but they're saying they're influenced by the, by the same things. They, they share the kind of same strands. It's like, um, you know, they, they're connected to the same at the, at the roots and they kind of follow the same source. Sure. It's, um, it's a little more than, in my view, quibbling, uh, People know when they see it, you know, they call it sure. woke, wokeism and, uh, you know, we know what the basic elements are. Uh, if you said the primary one being that if you have white skin, you're an oppressor. If mm -hmm. you have black skin, you're the oppressed. And America is systemically racist, deliberately designed that way. Frank, I'd like to understand how it, how it becomes. So, you know, I, I'm sure like all these different schools, they all have these now these, you know, they, they, they hire very high level administrators to, to push the diversity, equity, inclusion, right? So they have DEI heads and, and they start creating teams. What's it like at the Waukegan schools? And, and, and I'm curious to know how it becomes, you know, part of the curriculum, not, not because like you said, there's not a CRT curriculum, but uh, you know, I've, I've seen it and I've got examples and that's one of the examples I want to bring up from Nutrier, but you start to see it in the lesson plans. And if not in the lesson plans in some of the classes where, you know, even in physics or any class, it's introduced. So what, what do you see? And, um, you know, how, how, how is it making its way through class to class and teacher to teacher? So it's coming in, um, I think at Waukegan high school, we'll, I'll use as the example, uh, two ways you have it coming in organically through teachers. And this is just oftentimes through their own biases, through their own kind of political inclinations, uh, how they bring it into the classroom because they feel a calling to do so. And I think people actually underestimate that. They always want to look uh, for some like one central cause as where's this coming from as if we can, you know, kind of put the clamp on it and that's going to end it. I, I think they underestimate how much of this organically trickles down through teacher education programs. So as teachers, you know, we've getting new teachers in over the years and younger teachers bring it in what they learned from college. That's a really big force that I think people have underestimated. You then do have the um, kind of top-down model, which is where it's coming in through kind of administrative fiat. And um, we do see that. We have the, you know, Department of uh, Equity and Inclusion, and they are in the process of kind of formalizing these trainings, which I think will certainly accelerate things. Um, it just depends though, I think, depending on what school district you're looking at, it depends to which degree, which is a stronger force. I think my guess is that in most school districts, what's probably going to happen is that you're going to have teachers already doing this to a degree, already feel emboldened by it. And their school districts, once they kind of formally call teachers to do this and give them even more tools and more resources, that's where you're going to really see it accelerate because then they're going to have a mandate to do it. And they're going to feel really like, well, I've got the backing of my school district, my department chair, and now I have the tools to do it. Um, I think at Waukegan, 
I think at Waukegan, we are kind of, if anything, limited by, and I hate to say this, but the incompetency of the school district and that they can't really, they haven't been able to get this out as fast as they'd like to, and they haven't been able to provide the tools and resources. I mean, we don't really have, you know, curriculums necessarily for most classes or n nothing that anyone follows. So a lot of what you've seen is is organic, but I think that's important to to point out because just from what I've been able to see in my school district, these were organically derived lessons from teachers who just kind of had it upon themselves to bring it into their classroom. And a lot of people come to me and they say, you know, hey, Frank, I know this isn't, you know, most teachers don't want to do this or that they're not on board with this. And I'm like, I, I wish I wish I could agree with you, but, but you're wrong. Um, this is a bigger problem in terms of kind of the 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 problem, as for lack of better words, than people are willing to admit or to, to look at is that it, it comes from teachers. And uh, I don't know what the solution is, man. Well, you've been wrestling with what the solution is. I and mean, tell us what lessons you've learned. Uh, uh, we, we too have been fighting this, you know, for several years, starting at New Trier back four years ago now. And, and Ted especially has been involved with New Trier Neighbors. But what are the lessons that you're learning from this fight? I mean, one of the primary ones we learned, Ted, is, you know, don't back down one inch. you got to be brave. And people are going to call you fascists and racists and everything else. And, boy, we got some ugly emails from otherwise proper people uh, at the time when this started off. Uh, that has dissipated, by the way. Maybe that's a, a good sign. Uh, you know, at least there's rational discussion going on sometimes on this. Um, but what lessons have you learned about how to wage this battle? Yeah, I would say agreeing with what you said, don't back down an inch. Don't give them, don't give them any room. Don't apologize. Once you start apologizing and start backtracking, it's like they have you on your heels and they're going to use that to go in at you. I'm not saying don't, if you, if you legitimately have said something that, um, you know, you, you want to be sorry for, but they'll, they'll use anything they can. That's the other thing I was going to say. They, they will be ruthless and merciless and we use any weakness they can. Um, the big attacks I've had on me have had nothing to do with the substance of my argument. They've all been personal in nature. They've all been attempts to get me to be vulnerable and to back down from that vulnerability. And that caught me off guard a little bit. Um, even from colleagues, people I thought, you know, wouldn't sink to these levels, you know, and I spoke about this. I made the decision, you know, one of the big, um, attack points early on came was I, I had to take an FMLA for some health reasons and um, it, it was leaked out and I was like okay well you know how do I how do I deal with this like I'm like this isn't really relevant to what I'm talking about um, and so I just decided to embrace it and so and I said yeah I did like that's that's their attack and I, I wanted to use it to a point that was illustrative of how the low they're willing to sink where they're willing to use someone's personal health or something that they have to do to take care of that as a point of attack and so the other thing is that when they do attack you on these points lean into them you know most people i think that are, are reasonable and rational or people that are inclined to agree with us are, are going to be understanding and, and, and decent people and so generally you know when you're worried about why they're attacking you or what they're going to come after you for, if, if they find, some, you know, you went through divorce, you had a bankruptcy, lean into it. People will understand. They'll understand right. that more than they will why someone would ever bring that up as a point of attack. And so don't be afraid. They, they prey on your fear. And I got, I got to laugh earlier out of your, uh, you got in trouble with some satire or metaphor. Um, <laughs> we've, uh, we've, we've had that problem here. I'm, so many people just don't get it when you satire or metaphor. you got to attach a, a smiley wink, wink face or something right, to it so right. that they um, – but uh, that's a lesson for all of us in many contexts. <laughs> um, uh, 
Y yeah. They, what, take, um, go ahead, Frank. Oh yeah, no, I was just gonna say with my with my satire, the whole you know chalkboard heresy, and I was painting things. Everyone got it. I mean, I would say nine out of ten people got what I was doing. But it just became a way to, you know, raise questions. Is this person mentally ill? And what does he mean? Because and that, my answer just became like, hey, look, it's not my problem. You can't, you know, read at grade level. I mean, I, I was getting a little snarky too. But I mean, what am I going to say? Um, and, and I think that most people understood what I was doing. But again, I think it became like a point where they were trying to sow uh, uh, any type of doubts they could about me. Uh, because they couldn't address my argument, so they thought, well, like, hey, let's go, let's go at it another way. Yeah, that's all they can do, right? Name call you and, and beat you down yep. to see if they can do it that way because they can't do yep. it on the merits. Listen, I think one one thing that has to be said, Frank, and you know, for, for those of us who who are you know fighting against a lot of the you know the ills of our our country or our state or our cities, um, you know, a lot of times we do it, uh, we write something, say something. Uh, and we don't have to pay the repercussions in the same way that I think you do because you're doing it and you're in the in the school, right? You're criticizing the the school and some of the things it's doing. And you have to live with your classmates. I saw your, your, your students, your, 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 you know, teachers, your administrators. So kudos to you because you're, you're, you're doing it in the middle of the, in the middle of the storm, I guess I would say. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. It's um, yeah, it's, you know, I think now people look at it and they'll say, um, and, you know, because I've received like job offers and stuff and I'll say, oh, you know, well, yeah, look at you. You benefited from it in some way before, whether it was attention. But early on, I had no clue what was going to happen and what I was doing. And so, um, you know, I, I think when I look at that point and I look back at why I did this, I think it was feeling that something had to be done. And I was worried about where this takes our country, and I saw it as a risk. I said, okay, so there's a risk to my job, and then there's this bigger existential risk to this country I love. And I said, I can wait for other people to do it. I think for a while I was, like, you know, when's someone going to talk about this? And no one was. So I said, okay, well, I guess it's going to be me. And I talked to my wife, and she was just kind of like, okay, dude, like, <laughs> <laughs> you didn't you know she didn't really she's like okay like you know i mean she she agreed but she just was like what can you say when someone says they're gonna do this and i felt like okay here we go and um i i found a lot of other people though out there that that supported me and, and other teachers that had kind of done a similar thing that um you know i drew inspiration on and there was a a lot of people i was able to connect with i think finding when you're going to do this find support it's out there you know I, I encourage teachers that may be listening to this or even parents that want to you know get involved and speak out you know reach out to people like me i will respond to the, your messages and a lot of us will and i'll get you linked into the support networks you need to uh you know make your move um yeah and there are a lot a lot of national resources out there now too um the teachers defending education is one group that comes to mind out of washington dc that provides guidance and and how to resist these things. Oh yeah. Parents uh, defending uh, that. Yeah. Parents defending education. Yep. And a rough ruffle all the guy who's written extensively about this. I, I think has had some very good suggestions too for mm -hmm. for how how to tackle these things rhetorically. I mean you're particularly articulate and a good writer. Um you know that that helps and and but uh you need someone like that at the at the forefront. I, and I just want to interject too we we at wire points criticized many teachers we certainly criticize teachers unions we lament the the failures in the schools but thank god for the good teachers that are out there and there's just you know we, we all have benefited my kids have benefited enormously throughout our lives from the benefit provided by good teachers and uh, uh you know i just want to say thank you to uh, people like you and the other good teachers that are that are out there uh because we know you get dragged into some of these these things that we're not we're not generalizing about all teachers when we make our criticisms thank you i appreciate that and um that, i mean that actually brings me uh up to something i, I didn't think about until um now but it, it's it's a good point when we talk about good teachers and and so forth i actually wrote a lot and was very um forthcoming about how i felt that um 
there was a period in, in my profession where I felt like I wasn't a good teacher. And um, now I've had students come forward and say, no, oh, you were a great teacher and stuff. But there were there were years where I felt like I was struggling and I just wasn't being my best. And that's something I've, I've re really wanted to kind of hammer across because the more I've gotten into this kind of fight, I think the system is such a bigger problem than we're willing to admit. And one of the things I really want to talk about is how does that system affect teachers? And there's this kind of lie that gets kind of uh, promoted about teachers where it comes from the unions and it comes from even teachers. And we're like, yeah, we're, we're doing the best we can. We're the best teachers out there and we're all great. And it's like, no, we're not. And I think a little bit of honesty can be kind of liberating where teachers can come out and say, look, like we're not doing so great under the system either. It's not great for us. Like we need to stop lying about it. We're not doing our best. And that doesn't mean we're bad people. It's because this system is fundamentally broken. And um, I think there needs to be more of that honesty in the conversation. Um, I think a lot of teachers would find it liberating if they were able to, you know, no longer keep lying to themselves about what's going on in our schools and say like, yeah, this is, this is affecting me uh, in negative ways too. And, um, you know, being honest about that and, uh, well, we'll yeah, help change the system. In fact, that that was going to be my last question: is to what extent uh, we, we all know that schools are suffering sh staffing shortages right now, right? Recruiting good teachers into the system is a major problem here and nationally. It, to what extent is that because anybody right of center would be turned off from going into this profession because of these problems? Uh, do you have any sense for that? Do you talk to young people considering that and you think it is a, a disincentive? Yeah, I mean, from young people I've, I've spoken to, I think that if you're young and conservative, education probably just seems off the books to you in the first place. Um, I, I think there's kind of natural forces at work that kind of keep conservatives away from education, which I, I won't go into, but I, I definitely think that's a, a factor there. I, I also think too that you know, um, young people, as they hear about what's going on inside schools, it doesn't seem like as great of a deal as it once was. And um, I think teachers are leaving because it's it's not so great inside, you know, the halls of schools as it once was. And um, I just think we need more teachers to actually kind of speak honestly about that. You know, it's it's becoming a problem. It's becoming a real problem how, how bad it's gotten and uh, how it's affecting people's health uh, psychologically, physically. I see a lot of teachers suffering because of that. And, yeah. Well, I think, I think, you know, your, your comments about a system, uh, you know, we mentioned the, the bad results in Waukegan and this isn't just Waukegan, mm -hmm. this is the entire system. We have, we have a paper coming out, out on that early in the year next year, but uh I, I'm looking at the teacher evaluation rates. If you go to the Illinois report card and you go to teachers for Waukegan, you look at the teacher evaluation. Here it is right here. Um, given those 13% results, reading, et cetera, 95% um, of the district's teachers in 2017 were, were evaluated as either excellent or proficient by an administrator or other evaluator, 95%. 2018, 98%. Uh, 2000, 100%. I don't. I don't really know what to do with that, other than uh, either everybody just is everybody's just great, like you said, and everybody just rates themselves great, and that's it. Um, but it, it's sad uh, because it, it it captures the essence of of how failed the system is. Lake Wobegon, everybody's above average. <laughs> it, you're definitely right. It's um, it, it's re it's it's problematic. I mean, everyone is proficient, and um, but no, but at the same time, no one, you know, people aren't really happy there either. I, I think that's the the big irony. And that's what I think a lot of teachers would find liberating is if they spoke honestly um, and, and were honest about themselves. No one wants to be in a system where you're just always proficient. And and that's just kind of what, you know, proficiency. That's that's not very exhilarating. And it's it's a big lie. It's a system that too, you know, you can't you don't even have the freedom to one of the reasons I think you you produce bad teachers in these systems is because you don't have the honesty to talk about when you're struggling and when you're not good. Because it's meant to, you know the lie is that we're all doing great and 
only promote affirming messages of the school. So it's unheard of for a teacher to say, yeah, I'm really struggling. I feel like this just isn't my year and I'm not performing well. That's like, what, what are you saying? You're not supposed to say that. You're supposed to say you're doing great. And so what happens is, is when you are struggling, you just keep it to yourself. And that in turn breeds more problems and it becomes kind of self-defeating and then it becomes self-fulfilling. Then you do start to become ineffective. So yeah, it's, it's Frank, there's, I, there's too much to go into, but it's just, it's a real yeah. problem. I, I mentioned I wanted to compare you. We talked a lot about Waukegan. Now oh, I want sure. to bring it to, to Nutrier. Uh, which, which you know, would have the opposite kind of results at the state level. And uh, recently, a parent brought to my attention a um, a work they had to do in the class. And in one of the slides that popped up in front of the kid was a slide that has a big typing. If if you could see it, it's just a, on the top of the page. It says privilege in big capital letters. And then what it asked the kids to do is to circle those things that uh, the areas of privilege that apply to you. And so I guess I guess what this means is, you know, each kid would look at it and circle, you know, they, by, by, I guess by the number of things they circle, they can determine how privileged they are or not. And so I'll just read this out since obviously people can't see it. But sure. What you, know, you have privilege. Here are the things that you could circle. Parents are married. White. Uh, parents are heterosexual. Uh, if you're male, if you're heterosexual, if you're cisgender. If you have no learning disability, if you're English speaking, if you have no physical disability, if you're a Christian, and if you're middle or owning class people. Now, it says that nobody else is going to see this, but only the teacher can see it. It won't be shared. But, um, you know, kids are being asked to circle this, you know, circle these things. And I guess in some form, there's a discussion. You know, how should how should parents that aren't worried about CRT think about this thing? Because like, like you said, come on, we're just talking about privilege. We're just talking about if people have a better, you know, they, they drew a better lot. Um, why is it so bad in a place like Nutrier? Well, I mean, these are privileged by, people, aren't they? Do you know by chance what class that was occurring in? It's uh, ninth grade English. So the first thing I'd ask as a teacher is, is what the hell is that doing in an English class? Why aren't you teaching our kids to read? Um, what does that have to do with the curriculum you're doing. I mean, that's what always gets me. It's always English classes, it seems. I mean, that's kind of my thing. And I'd say, what is going on from that perspective? The second question is, what business is, is any of this of the teachers? And 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 how is this helpful? I mean, what it seems like to me is kind of a, a form of a self-flagellation, where it's about kind of listing your sins and admonishing yourself in front of a class or in front of a teacher for for what purpose um it's bizarre i think it, it's so bizarre and i think that until people start calling it out as such and 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 saying such things like what is this doing in english class this is bizarre this is strange um and why would you do this like what's your purpose i mean i'd really want to hear the teacher defend themselves i think parents should be outraged and, and kind of disgusted. And the first thing someone's going to say about me is they're going to say, well, yeah, that's because you benefit from privilege and all these things. And and there's my problem with this line of thinking is it's so, there's so many assumptions built into it. So it does exactly what it purports to be against, which is judge people based on kind of their skin color or their gender. So someone looks at me and they say, well, you must be, you know, because you're white and because you're male or they assume I'm male. I guess you can't assume that anymore, <laughs> but they would assume all the, you know, you must have privilege, but they don't know the first thing about me. They don't know that my mother was an immigrant. They don't know what anything about my home life. They don't know that I grew up with, uh, from a young age, obsessive compulsive disorder, which, uh, put me at you know, and ADHD, uh, which put me at a lot of disadvantages and made life extremely difficult for me. Probably statistically, if you look at those two things, uh, would put me up there, you know, with maybe someone who was gay uh, in terms of the uh, struggles they might face. Um, so, you know, those, you know, having, you know, mental health issues dealing with as a young person is extraordinarily difficult and punishing um, specifically the two I mentioned. And so, but they just assume these things. And, and so why didn't I, why don't I talk about that? Well, because 
first of all, you know, just because someone doesn't have doesn't have those things, I I may have had disadvantages, but that having disadvantages doesn't necessarily mean that the person next to me is privileged. It just means that they don't have those disadvantages. <laughs> and um and I think that's important to, to kind of keep in context. And second of all, what good does it do? What good would it have done me, you know, at, at that age? My, the attitude I got from my parents was just kind of like, yeah, it, it really sucks. And it, it's not fair. But what are you going to do about it? You're going to be mad at people? You're going to start listing off other people's the way, you know, and anytime I went down that road too, it was very, you know, and this came from having an immigrant mother and um. You know, my family's from Australia, so, and their attitude's a little different there, but it was very quickly kind of smacked out of me. Like, nope, we don't do that. We don't, I don't care about how much money other people have or what they have. You know, this is who you are. This is what this family is, where we come from. This is what, the, you know, and we just don't do that. And well, you know, I said, well, I'm going to have to work twice as hard. And my grandmother would say, I guess you are. You're going to have to work twice as hard. You better get to it, huh? And she was right. And uh, it's very different from what we're used to hearing, <laughs> but it's true. Persistence well, conquers everything. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wasn't allowed to feel sorry for myself. And believe me, the, the inclination was there at times. I could look at, you know, my peers not having to deal with these things and, and all the different ways it affected me and the, you know, what it was like to, you know, at, you know, at 13 have crippling anxiety to where you couldn't function some days and, I could get really, I could really go into a bad place with that, really a victimized place. And they just, you know, she just wouldn't let me. And even still, she's still alive to this day. And she's, you know, st <laughs> that still kind of keeps me going. She won't let me, you know, if I feel bad for myself, nope. She, she doesn't care. She doesn't want to hear it. What are you going to do about it? And um, so it, it comes down to at the end of the day, what are we fostering in our, in our children, in our students? You know, guilt, shame weakness, victimhood, or resiliency, um, the tools to overcome things. I mean, that's, that to me is what's more important. Anyone can feel bad for themselves, but are we, are you teaching the kids how to overcome that resiliency? That's, that's so critical. And at its worst, at its worst hatred for, for white people. I mean, there's yeah. some of that. I've been undoubtedly, this is contributing to the level of violence to some extent that we're saying. So. Yeah. And, and I don't think people want to talk about that. You know, there's a tendency, I've seen this before. People say, well, we don't like, the, the, don't get me wrong. So there, there have been certain white nationalist groups that have tried to co-opt and, and, and cling on to the anti-CRT movement and kind of be like, Hey guys, look at us. You know, we, we get your against CRT, you know, come look at uh, what we're talking about. And so they're kind of trying to, to get into this, but I, Okay, I get that. But there is a level of kind of anti-whiteness inherent in some of this in that, and I don't mean to say that, I'm not trying to play it off as that, that means that there's a, a victimhoodness that should, white people should adopt. I think that's what the white nationalists want to take on. But there is an argument that is being made that being white is something to be ashamed of and something to feel guilty over. And so when I say anti-white, that's what I mean, that it's it's an original sin. So if you're white, that is an original sin that you're born of. And I think that's just a, a very terrible way to think about your identity. And I think, too, it plays right into, this is something we're not talking about, plays right into the white identity movement's hand. If, if you, I told someone this, I talked to actually a school board president, and, you know, we had a conversation about this uh, at Waukegan, and I said, look, I said, if you're a minority, I said, what you should be worried about is the reaction to this stuff from the white identitarians. I said, they're going to be using this. I said, if you get a bunch of disaffected white people who've been told that their original sin is being white, and then you have these white nationalist groups saying, hey, we're, we're not saying that. We're telling you actually that you can be very proud of it, and it's a great thing, and it's, you're the best, actually. I said, think about what that looks like. And he understood it. I mean, I when I said that to him, he's you know he's like, no, I, I get that. We need more people to get that because that may be 
that backlash from white people may be more scary than anything that CRT is able to produce. I don't know. It's like you got two competing forces here. I don't want either side to win, but yeah. Well, Frank, um, we appreciate your your commentary, your honesty, your your obviously your experience with this, and and for standing up strong. I, I love I love the um, the points you're making just a few minutes ago. It's about resiliency and Mark uh, persistence. Uh, the value of the individual doesn't matter what color they are. It's it's be the best individual you can be and invest in yourself and, and find people around you who lift you up, not down. So um, we thank you for that and uh, we wish you good luck. And, and as we said, you know, hang in there strong. We're, we're supporting you and uh, we have a lot of educating to do. Um, we love, as, as Mark said, you know, we, we're, we're huge fans of of great teachers. We're, we're great fans of of great schools, uh, but we're not happy with with bad systems. And so we want to see a lot of change. Uh, eventually we'll talk about school choice a lot but uh, I think we'll leave it there for now but thank you so much for coming on with us and uh, to our listeners thank you for joining us thank you, you so good fight Frank yeah, thank you take care appreciate it bye 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 bye